Hi, everybody. This is Rose Espinola with Public Citizens Global Trade Watch. And I am so excited about this webinar that we are co-hosting with Centro de los Derechos de Migrante and with our revolution. Uh, if, if you have on your camera, please turn it off. I think I've turned off most ca people's cameras already. We just want to minimize distractions. Uh, so first things first, this is a grassroots call, and this call is not open to press. So if you are press, please get off the line, and please reach out to us because we would love to talk offline. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is what our goals are for today. So Erica from Our Revolution and Elizabeth from CDM, Centro de los Derechos de Migrantes, and I have been talking about the difficulty of talking trade in the migrant justice space and the difficulty of talking immigration in the trade space. And yet the three of us have seen how trade and migration go hand in hand. And so our hopes and dreams and goals for this call is that you all leave this call being able to do three things. First, talk about how migration and trade are connected with your friends, family, and in your organizing. Second, we want you to be able to incorporate both trade and migration as key issues in your issue platforms with your organizations. And then three, during this call, we wanna make sure that you're able to take action, uh, both to protect immigrant and migrant communities and to replace NAFTA with a deal that benefits poor and working people in all three countries. So how are we gonna do this? First, Erika Andiola is going to go over the state of immigrant rights with a special focus on DACA. And, uh, Erica was arrested last week in front of the Trump Tower protesting uh, Trump's rollback of DACA. And we're really lucky to have her on. Next, Elizabeth Malden with Centro de los Derechos de Migrante will talk about NAFTA's impact on how migrant workers. Then I'll dig into the timeline for NAFTA renegotiations. We'll hear from Ivan Polanco uh, in Mexico, uh, who's part of the National Association of Small, Small Producers. And we'll also hear from Areli Ponce Hernandez, who is with CDM. Then you're going to get to take action on this call. I guarantee you, you will not leave here without taking action if it's up to me. And then we're leaving 20 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to hand it over to Erica uh, with our political director at Our Revolution. Erica, can you screen share with us? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Um, just put on my video as well. And I'm going to. All right. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, and we see you too. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, uh, again, um, Rose, thank you so much, and you know, thank you um, for leading on this. Uh, this is a super important issue, um, and this is a conversation that usually doesn't happen uh, when we talk about you know trade and migration um, and the link between them. Um, this is definitely a very personal issue. This is something that, you know, affected my own family coming to, to the United States from Mexico. Um, and it's important that we start talking about how this affects um, not only American workers, which is definitely something that we're going to be continuing to fight for to make sure that we protect American workers, but also how, you know, uh, the impact of workers in uh, Mexico and other countries that are also affected by, tra by trade um, impact migration into the United States. Um, and so one of the very important reasons why we wanted to have this conversation was because there is um, a lot of basically um, blame uh, that has been happening and scapegoating uh, towards Latin American immigrants. Uh, Mexicans in particular have been basically targeted by the Trump administration. Um, and, you know, the, the narrative has been um, that, you know, we come and, and take jobs and that, 
uh, you know, we have to figure out a way to build a huge wall uh, to make sure that people are not coming to take those jobs. But without, um, Trump never actually mentions the huge role that all of these types of trade agreements have had on the lives of Mexicans uh, and other um, immigrants, uh, especially, for example, in, in, in Latin America. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation um, and we're going to be talking a little bit more of how, you know, trade actually affected Mexico uh, as we move along with other, other speakers. Um, so I wanted to share with you all um, this newspaper that I found. I actually worked for the Bernie Sanders campaign um, dur during the primary and I came across this newspaper when we were looking for information about NAFTA, and it's actually an op-ed that was written by uh, Senator Sanders um, in the 90s when he went to Mexico and he was already opposing NAFTA uh, at this time. And um, you know, you can't really see the the, the letters as much, but uh, there's there's a quote from him. Oops, I apologize. Um, you know that that basically talks about. Um, let me see if I can. Well, I can't remove this. Uh, but it says, uh, in Mexico, I observe workers employed at a high-tech General Motors radio assembly plant earning $1.80 an hour and living in shacks and without electricity or running water. Um, and so I put, I put this quote in, in, in this, in this op-ed from, from Bernie from back in the day uh, because, you know, there's, there's again, the importance of talking about how this uh, affected the economy of, of, of Mexico. So um, what does that have to do with migration? Well, um, what ended up happening with NAFTA, and again, there's going to be a little bit more of conversation about this with our, with our next speakers, uh, but basically what NAFTA ended up doing was that it created um, uh, a situation where over 2 million Mexicans uh, you know, who were engaged in farming and, and, and that type of work lost their, their livelihood. Um, and they were unfortunately unable to compete with, you know, with US uh, subsidies from corn. Um, and it, what ended up doing was, you know, a lot of the people that lived in these rural areas ended up uh, wanting to or migrating into the cities um, and trying to find work and all they could find for the most part uh, was, you know, works in, in places that we call, for example, maquiladoras, uh, where, you know, uh, companies that uh, went from the United States to Mexico and hire uh, tons of, of, of people there, literally earning, like Bernie was saying on that op-ed, $1.80 an hour. Um, and, you know, what that created was, uh, you know, working conditions, as well as uh, wages that pushed a lot of people to, into the United States from Mexico in the 90s to, to look for work. Um, I personally, my family came from the US uh, in 1998, um, and you know we were able to actually see uh, what these kinds of uh, conditions created for, for families there. Um, you know, we also came basically, you know, looking, uh, we were running from domestic violence, but we were also, you know, running from uh, economic an economic situation where a single mother of five children who was going through domestic violence couldn't you know couldn't figure out a way to to um, you know to support her family um, and so you can actually see this um, not only by you know looking and, and reading the stories of of Mexican uh, workers conditions uh, because of NAFTA. Uh, but also the numbers of people who actually migrated from Mexico into the United States was a lot higher. Um, there was about uh, from 2.9 million uh, immigrants in 1995 to a peak of 6.9 million uh, immigrants in 2007. This was after um, all of the, the uh, you know, after NAFTA was uh, enacted. And so... Um, why why is it important to remember this obviously this is something that has already passed but we are right now um not only talking about nafta renegotiations but also we are living all of all of um the immigrant communities who were basically pushed out of our countries um whether it was in mexico or in central america uh because of nafta 
and uh, CAFTA and a couple of, you know, and other trade agreements. Um, now we're basically the ones being attacked by the Trump administration, uh, not only through words, not only by calling us rapists and, you know, all kinds of other different uh, terms, but also by policy attacks. Um, and so just real quick, what have been those attacks that have happened against the, the immigrant community? You all probably have heard, um, you know, just three, three examples. Of that. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more on how you can take action you know, uh, helping push back against these attacks, but, you know, one, um, by using this entire framing of, uh, you know, immigrants coming to take jobs and, 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 you know, Mexicans being rapists and immigrants not for the Muslim community. I mean, you all know the narrative that has happened. Um, right now, there's about 800,000 undocumented immigrants uh, who came here as children uh, who are in danger of losing our deferred action. Um, and you will probably have heard of, of DACA, which is basically the deferred action for childhood arrivals. Um, and you know, for us, um, this is a crucial moment um, because you know, the announcement that was just done by Trump basically created a six month period of, of uh, you know, getting Congress to, or pushing Congress to act on a legislation that would protect you know, the 800,000 uh, people like myself who, you know, if are not protected by Congress by the six, by the six months, uh, we're going to not only be losing our uh, work permits, uh, which DACA, you know, gives us, it doesn't give us a path to citizenship or even uh, legal status as residents. It also, it, it just gives us a work permit. Um, and that specific program right now um, has been terminated by, by the Trump administration. And, you know, like I said, unfortunately, we only have six months to get uh, Congress to do, you know, something, whether it's passing the DREAM Act or passing some sort of protection. Um, the other, um, something that you will probably be hearing about pretty soon, which is also another policy change that the, that the Trump administration has been pushing for, is also uh, ending a TPS, which is uh, the protective, temporary protective status. Uh, for people from Central America, Haiti, and other countries uh, that are either uh, went through um, natural disasters or, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, unbearable violence um, where they had to seek refuge in the United States. That program is also right now being looked at by the administration, um, and they're also having talking about ending it, uh, which, again, you know, Central America was also a huge target uh, of trade agreements, and unfortunately, we're, there were also a ton of people being displaced uh, because of the economic reasons and also because of violence. And then third, of course, have you you have all heard of mass deportations that have been happening under the Trump administration that have followed on the thousands of uh, and millions of deportations from from the Obama administration. Now, you know, the Trump administration is using that same deportation machine to target immigrants all across the country. So I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. Um, like I said, there's going to be presenters uh, that are going to be talking about in detail how this has um, you know, impacted um, the economy in Mexico and other countries. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're all, you know, really, um, again, continuing to talk about how Trump is scapegoating immigrants. Um, and uh, we were going to talk about also how to take action, making sure that this, that this does not continue to happen. So thank you, Rose, and I'm going to pass it to, to our next speakers. Thank you, Rose and Erica, um, for this opportunity to share our experience um, working with migrant workers under NAFTA. Um, we're just going to adjust the camera here. <laughs> Maybe we'll just turn it off. <laughs> Do you want it off? There. Ah, oh, perfect. There All right. <laughs> um, I'm Elizabeth Malden, the policy director at Centro de los Derechos del Migrante, and it's a pleasure to um, have this opportunity to speak with each of you. Um, Centro de los Derechos de Migrante, or the Center for Migrant Rights, or CDM, is a binational migrant workers' rights organization with headquarters in Mexico City and offices in Cuxla, Waka, Oaxaca, and Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I think I need to can go back to We shared the incorrect screen. <laughs> Ah, we fixed it. Thank you. Um, 
So CDM's work combines worker organizing and leadership development on the ground in Mexico with legal support and policy advocacy. But the heart of our work is our Comité de Defensa del Migrante, a group of migrant workers and their families who are courageous community leaders in migrant sending communities across Mexico. Later in the session, you'll hear from Arareli Ponce Hernandez, a member of the Comité de Defensa del Migrante, an outspoken advocate for migrant workers and a petitioner under the current NAFTA agreement. Over the past 12 years, we've learned from Comité members like Arareli and other workers who call us to complain about abuses that they experience while working in the U.S. that the shortage of economic opportunities in their communities drives them to migrate on temporary work visas. Many migrant workers who travel to the U.S. for temporary work come from economically disadvantaged rural communities in Mexico, often at great personal expense. For many Mexicans, the U.S. guest worker programs are an opportunity to provide for their families. These workers have limited economic opportunities at home, so they choose to migrate on temporary work visas that lack protections, lack monitoring and meaningful enforcement, and lack access to justice. It's an unfair choice for these workers who often know that they will face exploitation here in the U.S. So NAFTA impacts the lives and working conditions of the hundreds of thousands of migrant workers who labor in the, in the United States every year. Migrant workers are a particularly vulnerable sector given the workplace and recruitment abuses that they suffer, the language barriers they face, and the challenges of accessing effective cross-border justice. Both in their recruitment in Mexico and employment in the U.S., migrant workers whose visas are tied to, their, to a single employer here in the U.S. face economic coercion, discrimination, wage theft, retaliation, and other abuses that can rise to the level of human trafficking. In a recent CDM report on the H2 programs entitled Recruitment Revealed, we issued findings based on interviews with over 220 Mexican H2A and H2B workers. 58% of the workers were charged recruitment fees, which were illegal. 47% took out loans to cover pre-employment costs, 52% were not shown contracts, and 10% were charged fees for jobs that did not exist. The H2A agricultural and H2B non-agricultural guest worker programs are enormously reliant upon Mexican workers, and these programs are rapidly expanding. Last year, 72% of H-2B visas were issued to Mexican nationals, and 92% of H-2A visas were issued to Mexican nationals. In raw numbers, 184,359 visas were issued in these two programs alone to Mexican nationals. That's not to mention J-1s, the TN visa, H-1B, and numerous other visa categories. The H-2A program, which does not have a cap, is growing rapidly as employers seek to expand their migrant workforce in terms of numbers of workers, the period of time that workers can stay, and the range of industries that are considered agricultural. The number of H-2A jobs certified in 2016 increased 14% over 2015 and has increased 160% since 2006. And Congress recently gave the Department of Homeland Security the power to expand the H-2B program, which is statutorily capped at 60,000 workers per year, and the Department of Homeland Security went ahead and added 15,000 visas to the program overnight. The expansion of the programs, coupled with limitations on the Department of Labor's ability to protect workers, is a recipe for worker exploitation. Meaningful oversight, enforcement, transparency, and access to justice are more critical than ever to protecting migrant workers from abuses, exploitation, and human trafficking. NAFTA renegotiation should protect migrant workers and ensure their access to justice. NAFTA should require the government to protect migrant workers, guaranteeing them a broad set of rights. NAFTA should provide workers with a meaningful complaint and dispute resolution mechanism that's transparent, that provides clear timelines for responses, and it gives migrant workers a voice in their own complaints. And it doesn't impose barriers to access. And I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Rose. Thanks. I'm gonna...
take over the camera. All right, I think you can see me all right. And uh, one of our interns, Olivia, is there in the background with us. And, uh, thank you, Olivia, for all your work with us. And so I want to talk about where things are at with NAFTA. But first, uh, let me screen share. Let's see. Oh, we're already on screen share. Great. So I want to talk about how I ended up working on trade. I started organizing nine years ago with Mecha, the Chicano student movement on college campuses and high, high schools around the country. And I organized for immigration reform and also organized for uh, on labor. And we worked with hotel workers who won a union and we worked with farm workers in Florida who doubled their wages. And at one point I learned about trade and I learned that these exploitative war policies, war and trade policies are what force people from their homes. And so when I was a kid, I thought that my father would come home from work at midnight every night with paint in his hair and ask me to sit behind him and pull the paint out of his hair. And I thought that he never came to school with me because, because we're Mexican American because we're an immigrant family. And when I learned about trade, it was like this eureka moment. And I was really angry about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I ended up going to work with Bernie. I was a little bit skeptical and also thought that he was the best hope for defeating the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And after the primary, I decided to dive full into this work. And we defeated the TPP. And I thought of the work of the people on this call uh, all around the country, holding their members of Congress accountable, especially target members on trade, people, members of Congress who are swing votes. I saw that how that made it impossible for the Obama administration to ever get the Trans-Pacific Partnership through Congress. And so a year ago, we never thought it would have been possible to replace NAFTA with a deal that actually benefits people on the planet. We thought that was impossible. And after building so much power as a movement and defeating the TPP, it actually looks like we can win something better. And so I want to talk of, I want to just revisit some of the things that Elizabeth and Erica touched on. Some of the main ways that NAFTA has impacted uh, immigrant communities and has also hurt Mexico. So more than 2 million Mexicans engaged in farming lost their livelihoods. And when we think about why, there's two big reasons. Before NAFTA, Mexico only imported corn if, local, if the country couldn't produce enough on its own. The other big thing was that Mexico's participation in NAFTA was conditioned on changing it's revolutionary era land reform. So the Mexican constitution uh, for after the Mexican revolution allowed for ajillos, which are communally owned land plots. And NAFTA required Mexico to do away with this ajillo system. And it led, uh, it's one of the factors that led to more than 2 million Mexicans losing their livelihoods. Real average annual wages in Mexico have fallen 9% below pre-NAFTA levels. And we're also experiencing job loss and lower wages in the United States. Since NAFTA went, went into effect, almost 1 million US jobs have been certified as lost to NAFTA by just one narrow government program. And we know that it's communities of color that are hit hardest by uh, job loss due to trade. But I think the worst part is that U.S. corporations are able to sue the Mexican government before a tribunal of three corporate lawyers. And these lawyers can award corporations unlimited sums to be paid by Mexican taxpayers, including for the loss of quote unquote expected future profits. And something that really irks me is that these tribunalists can one day be a judge and the next day 
there's this rotating door where they can go and be a lawyer for one of the multinational corporations that are suing the, the Mexican, the U.S., or the Canadian government. So multinational corporations only need to convince these three corporate lawyer judges that uh, a Mexican law or safety regulation violates their special NAFTA rights. And the decisions of these tribunals are not subject to appeal and the amount has no limit. Uh, so this corporate power grab is formally called Investor State Dispute Settlement, ISDS. How many of you have heard of ISDS? Write in the chat box if you've already heard about it and what you've heard about it. So I wanna talk about this one case that really boils my blood, Metal Quack versus Mexico. San Luis Potosí refused to grant the U.S. firm Metal Cloud a construction permit, which it had also previously denied to the contaminated, it had also denied to the contaminated facility's previous Mexican owner until and unless the site was cleaned up. And because Mexico, because the government of San Luis Potosí, it's a state in Mexico, uh, denied this, uh, denied this permit, uh, Metal Quad brought a case to an ISDS tribunal, and San Luis Potosí and its taxpayers were forced to pay Metal Quad $15.6 million in compensation. So, where are we at right now? And can we really defeat ISDS? Can we really get protections for migrant workers? And can we really negotiate a deal that's going to be good for working people in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico? There's been two rounds of negotiations. The next round is September 23rd through 27th in Ottawa. The first two rounds, one was in D.C., August 16th through 20th. Another was uh, September 1st through 5th, Labor Day weekend in Mexico City. And... The U.S. and Mexico want to finish negotiations by December because of the Mexican election coming up in Mexico in July of next year and also because of midterm elections in the United States. They feel like politically this has to be renegotiated by December. And here's the thing, we can still win a better deal. And our bright red line is no ISDS because we know that if ISDS is in the deal, the whole deal is going to be bad. It's going to be bad for immigrants, bad for migrant workers, bad for poor working people across North America. And if ISDS is not in the agreement, then we will actually be able to take a look and see if it meets our high standards on all these other issues, the environment, migrant worker rights, um, protections for communities that are trying to pass safety regulations like San Luis Potosí did in the case of Metal Quad. And the really exciting thing is that a few years ago, nobody knew what ISDS was. And suddenly, every week, there are articles being published in major publications like the Wall Street Journal about ISDS and how it's coming under attack in the U.S. and globally. Already countries like India and Indonesia and Australia and Ecuador have started to either withdraw from agreements with ISDS in it or uh, they've started to they've started to eliminate ISDS from new agreements, and this is a huge deal, and it's a huge deal that that the United States is finally joining this global movement. And we've heard that there are actually proposals being floated at the negotiating rounds to get rid of ISDS or to change ISDS, and so. The most important thing right now is to make it clear to our members of Congress that they must come out and oppose a uh, corporate tribunal, since that's our bright red line. It's very black and white compared to the other things we want in a, a good trade agreement. And we need to make it clear to NAFTA's, tr sorry, we need to make it clear to Trump's trade advisors that they can negotiate this beautiful agreement but that they will fall flat on their faces and be embarrassed and they will never have the votes in Congress to pass a NAFTA replacement that does not meet the standards that Elizabeth, Erica, and I have laid out on this call. So with that, um, I just want to tell you 
this is winnable. Our movement is huge. 400 people in 40 states are doing on the ground organizing to replace NAFTA. And nearly 7,000 people rallied and marched in New York City in response to DACA repeal. And 50,000 activists submitted comments to the U.S. Trade Representative demanding a NAFTA replacement that actually benefits working people in all three NAFTA countries. And it caused the U.S. Trade Rep's web form to crash. So that's the U.S. Trade Rep. And the U.S. Trade Rep is part of Trump's cabinet. And our movement submitted so many comments that their web form just stopped working. I am going to hand it over to Ivan Polanco from the Asociación Nacional de Empresas Comercializadoras de Productores de Campo, the National Association of uh, Agriculture, Small Farmers and Agricultural Producers. And I am going to do translation. Uh, Erika, can we make sure that Ivan Polanco is unmuted? ¿Ya me escuchan ahí? Sí, te escuchamos. Dale dos frases a la vez para que yo traduzca poco a poco. Ah, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, primero que nada, muchas gracias por la invitación para poder participar y, y exponer un poco los resultados que ha traído el, el, el Telecan a, a, a México, en particular a los pequeños y medianos agricultores. Eh, la ANEC es una eh, asociación de pequeños y medianos productores, en particular de granos básicos, que a la fecha eh, están eh, transitando hacia un sistema de producción más sustentable, amigable con el medio ambiente, y que están impulsando o quieren que pretenda sea la base para la soberanía alimentaria. Mi nombre es Iván Polanco y trabajo con una asociación of small and medium-sized agricultural producers, which right now is focused on transitioning to more sustainable uh, ways of, of producing agriculture. El Telecam para la pequeña y mediana agricultura mexicana no solo ha resultado nocivo y perjudicial, sino so que... So the NAFTA for small and medium-sized agricultural produ producers has been, has been a big problem. Aún y cuando la pequeña y mediana agricultura aporta entre el 60 y 70% de la producción agrícola de este país. Even though small and medium size produce, uh, agric agric agricultural producers are responsible for 30 and 60% of our country's produ agricultural production. Y sobre todo en, en el cual siguen viviendo más de 25 millones de habitantes. And 25, 25 millones. Sí. 25, 25 millones de personas continúan a vivir de la producción agricultural. Production. Y después de 20 años... De, de o de más de 20 años de implementación del Telecán, nos hemos dado cuenta que la apertura comercial llevada al extremo solo puede lograr que un país y un sector mantenga a sus habitantes en la pobreza y que año con año las condiciones de producción de la tierra sean más adversas y sobre todo que tengamos alimentos de mala calidad. And what we've realized after more than 20 years with NAFTA is that when a country opens, opens itself up to extreme free trade, it results in year after year, uh, the people in the land getting poorer. Y que tengamos alimentos de mala calidad. And it also results in our products getting worse and worse in quality. Y esto nos lo, nos lo dan los resultados. Tenemos una balanza comercial agropecuaria deficitaria de manera sistemática, es decir, importamos mucho más de lo que exportamos. And so we have this big problem where we import far more than we export in terms of, of agriculture. Lo que nos ha llevado a que 40% de los alimentos que se consumen en México sean importados, es decir, hemos perdido soberanía alimentaria. And so a great deal of the 
of of the food we eat in Mexico is imported, and we've lost uh, our food our food sovereignty here, here in Mexico. Y sobre todo que se haya destruido el tejido social, es decir, las familias rurales se ven obligadas a migrar en su totalidad o algún miembro de la familia y por lo consiguiente se separan las mismas. And we're also losing our way of life because people who used to work in agriculture are seeing themselves forced to move and families are being broken up. Pero sobre todo que los grandes beneficiados de esta apertura comercial, de estos tratados comerciales, sean las grandes empresas transnacionales. Háblese o and dígase. Above all, and above all, we know that the people who are most benefiting off of these so-called trade agreements are big multinational companies. Háblese de Cargill, háblese de Tyson, háblese de Walmart, Maseca, Bimbo, entre otras. It's companies like Walmart and Bimbo, among others. Y el consumidor mexicano se ha visto afectado con precios altos de alimentos, pero sobre todo alimentos de mala calidad, alimentos congelados, transgénicos, entre otros. And so the Mexican consumer has been affected by very high prices, but also products that are very poor quality, not healthy for us. Y sobre todo que el sector agrícola no crezca, es decir, que estemos estancados durante los que hemos estado estancados durante los últimos 30 años sin tener oportunidades de, de, de incrementar la producción agrícola. And so agricultural producers, we've been stalled for, for decades without hopes uh, of improving our conditions. Y sobre todo sigue habiendo tareas pendientes. La primera es cómo cuidar, no cómo cuidar la biodiversidad, las culturas y la calidad de los alimentos que consumen los mexicanos y mexicanas. Like how to protect biodiversity of the food that we Mexicans eat. Tener la oportunidad de elegir entre quedarse a trabajar en las localidades con una vida digna, es, derecho, es decir, el derecho a no migrar, o de migrar respetando los derechos humanos. And we're also talking about rectifying the situation and people being able to stay in the places that they're from, or to being able to choose to migrate and having their rights respected as migrants pero sobre todo generar herramientas que permitan la inclusión social y mejorar las, las condiciones de vida de las personas respetando su cultura. But above all, uh, we, we need for a NAFTA replacement to respect our culture and better our life. A final de cuentas, entendemos que la mejor manera de evitar la migración forzada no es construyendo muros. And so, I, at the, in the end, the best way to prevent migration is not by building a wall. Sino generando mejores condiciones de vida y laborales en las localidades rurales. But para, rather, we need to improve the situation for people who live in rural communities. Para evitar que la gente quiera seguir migrando arriesgando su vida. So that people don't have to keep migrating and risking their lives. Y aún y cuando... El proceso, el, la apertura comercial y el neoliberalismo han tratado de disminuir a los pequeños y medianos campesinos. Seguimos estando presentes y seguimos siendo la fuerza de producción en México y a nivel mundial. And so neoliberalism and so-called free trade have made it very difficult for campesinos to stay in the countryside and continue producing food. Porque además de ser la salida para el cambio climático somos la salida para la producción de alimentos a nivel local y a nivel mundial. Because in addition to us being the solution to climate change, we're also the solution for solving global hunger. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to pass it over to Areli, who's going to talk about her experience Uh, who's going to talk about her experience as a migrant worker in the United States. And I noticed that we're at 2.45, so I can commit to stick around until 3.30, but I, it seems like not everyone, not all our speakers may be able to. So 
And why don't we hand it over to our Bailey and then we'll move into action steps and questions and answers for those who can stick around. Hola, Arbel. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenas tardes a todos los que me ven, me escuchan. Oh, we are going to turn on the camera for Arbel. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. How's it going? Uh, thank you for listening in and watching in. Eh, como lo acaba de decir, yo vengo del estado de Hidalgo, en el municipio de Chapulhuacán, en México. I come from the state of Hidalgo, from the town of Chapulhuacán, uh, in, in Mexico. Eh, durante más de 10 años yo he venido a los Estados Unidos con visas H2B. For more than 10 years I've come to the U.S. with an H2B visa. Y yo estoy aquí para hablarles sobre mi experiencia y también como para abogar alguna para abogar sobre las protecciones laborales que pedimos por el acuerdo de la clan. I'm here to talk about my experience and also to tell you what we're fighting for with the with the replacement of NAFTA. Eh, en el 2000 en el año 2000 yo terminé la preparatoria y yo quería seguir estudiando, pero las condiciones económicas de mi familia pues no me permitieron estudiar una licenciatura. In 2000 I graduated from high school and I wanted to go to college but my family's economic situation didn't allow me to, to, to go to college. Así que tuve que hacer lo que muchos de mis vecinos de mi municipio que es emigrar a este país con una visa la cual durante dos años batallé para conseguir una. So I had to do what a lot of my neighbors in the town I'm from did and that's migrate to this country and I worked for two years in order to get this each this it's to get this H2B visa. Me refiero a batallar porque las oportunidades que se daban en ese entonces y que se siguen dando solamente era para hombres, para mujeres era muy escaso que hubiera una falta de trabajo. And it was very difficult because most of the opportunities to to come to the United States and work on a visa are for men and opportunities for women are very hard to come by. Cuando por fin logré obtener una visa de trabajo fue para trabajar en una fábrica de chocolates en el estado de Luisiana la cual fue una experiencia muy desagradable. So finally I got a visa to go work at a chocolate factory in Louisiana and it was a, a very horrible experience. Ya que por ser mujeres nos discriminaban y nos trataban como sexo débil que no podíamos hacer algo más fuerte que los hombres. Because we were discriminated against as women and we were treated as if we were the weaker the weaker sex because we weren't men. Y Pues nosotros, yo no sabía que teníamos derecho, yo pensé que el venir aquí era solamente trabajar y obedecer las órdenes porque creía yo que estaba en un país que no era el mío. And I didn't think that we had any rights because I thought that I was here on a visa and I just had to follow orders in this country that isn't mine. Así que durante cuatro años aguantamos malos tratos, malos eh, discriminación y todo tipo de trato con tal de conservar el empleo ya que pues era nuestra única opción para estar trabajando con visa. And so for four years we we dealt with bad treatment, we dealt with discrimination because we saw this as the only way to, to keep our jobs. Hasta que ya nos dijeron que nosotros teníamos derechos y pues al exigirlos o pedirlos más que nada pues nos despidieron y dijeron que nosotros éramos mujeres problemáticas y que no no debíamos de estar aquí. And so once we started demanding or asking for our rights as workers, we, they fired us and told us that we were problematic women. Después quise conseguir otro trabajo y pues sufrí fraude durante tres veces por falsos reclutadores. And so then I tried to find another job and three times I dealt with fraud as I was looking for another job. Ya que ellos Al ver la necesidad de nosotras las mujeres, pues piensan, nos engañan diciéndonos que hay empleo y resulta que nos piden dinero y ese empleo no existe. So these recruiters, they would lie to us and they would ask us for money for a fee in order for them to find us work and in the end, no such work existed. El verano pasado me uní para a otros trabajadores para presentar una queja eh, bajo el acuerdo laboral de la CLAN. So last summer, I got together with other workers to bring a case uh, through NAFTA uh, in order to fight back. Pero la queja todavía no da resultados. 
but this complaint we made still hasn't resulted in much. Pienso que tanto Estados Unidos como México deberían de unirse para que protejan los derechos de nosotros que venimos como trabajadores temporales a, a, a este país. And so I think that the United States and Mexico actually need to get together and work together to protect the right of migrant workers who come from Mexico to the United States. Que nos ofrezcan protecciones laborales fuertes, resolviendo nuestras quejas y siendo transparentes en este proceso. And so what I'm asking is for governments to be accountable to migrant workers by providing strong labor protections, resolving our complaints and being transparent about the process. Pienso que los gobiernos no deben de ignorarnos porque el comercio no se puede separar del trabajo. And I think that the U.S. and Mexican governments cannot ignore us because trade and labor cannot be separated from one another. Ya que depende de nosotros, de las y los trabajadores que venimos de, de México, más que nada a, a laborar, como les había dicho, pues temporalmente en ese país. Because people in the United States depend on the migrant workers who come from Mexico to work in this country. Les podría platicar más de mi historia, pero desgraciadamente el tiempo no lo permite, así que gracias por su atención y pues esperemos que, que haya muy buenos resultados. Thank you very much for your time. I could go on and on, but time is limited and I'm hopeful about this fight. And so we want to make sure that you are able to take action during this call. You will take action right now while we speak. And I'm going to pass it over to Elizabeth to talk about the first way to take action. Hi, everyone. Um, now is a great time in the negotiation process for us to be demanding that the Trump administration include worker protection. Um, in the NAFTA replacement. And you have an opportunity right there on the screen in front of you to do that. If you if you go to contratados.org slash en, that's the English version of the website, slash NAFTA, um, you'll see that we've, uh, we've got a petition there for you to sign to tell the Trump administration um, to be sure to protect migrant workers in this process. Um, the way that we've seen trade agreements going is to drop the requirement that um, that signatories protect migrant workers. That's not where we want to see this go. We're seeing these programs expand enormously, and now is your opportunity to take act action. So please, while while we're on the call, go ahead and click on the link there, and um, you'll see some more information um, that will lead you to um, a letter to U.S. Trade Representative. Um, Robert Lighthizer, and I see some of you are already responding. That's great. Um, we've got four of you, but I see there are quite a few more on the call. So um, if people could just go ahead and click through, we're going to send this petition over um, once we get critical mass of signatures. What's your goal for additional signatures during this call? Well, how many of us are there? There's a hundred on the call. Someone's saying this link on the screen is not live. Um, I think it, that the um, interface doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, I think you're going to have to type it, the interface. Yeah, you'll right. have to type it into another tab. So go open a new tab on your screen and type in that address, contratados.org slash en slash NAFTA. And we want to get at least 40 people to sign while you're on this call. Elizabeth, how many do we have signed now? Eight. We have eight. Okay, we need 32 more people nice. to sign this petition for CDM, and we'll keep checking in um, as as we go through the other ways you can take action. Erika? Yes, thank you. Um, so for DACA, um, I'm actually, I'm gonna be... Can you speak up? Yeah, sorry. Is that better? Yep. Oh, perfect. So we have um, an, uh, on our website, uh, notrevolution.com, um, you can just go ahead and click on that link um, that I put on um, the chat. And uh, what we're asking right now for the most part is to get members of Congress to agree to, to put their recipients. Um, 
you know, it's important to call your own member of Congress, making sure that they understand that this is, you know, we have six months uh, that there is protection. Uh, if you have an extra minute to also make a call to um, Nancy Pelosi and Schumer, right now it's a really good uh, time to make sure that, you know, the Democratic leadership also uh, holds the line and actually protect you know, DACA recipients, perhaps through the DREAM Act um, as, as legislation, but also that they are not trading, uh, you know, the DREAM Act for enforcement um, or that they're, you know, basically willing to protect DREAMers just um, also with adding enforcement and deportation for the rest of our family. So, um, you know, just real quick, make a call for your member of Congress, you know, tell them to protect DACA recipients and also call Democratic leadership uh, and ask them to pass a clean, clean um, bill to protect DACA recipients. Thank you, Erica. And if you are able to do that, please press the raise button, uh, button on your screen if you're online. Please press, press the raise button, uh, raise hand button on your screen so Erica knows how many of you she can count on to call into your member of Congress this afternoon once the webinar is over. Elizabeth, how many people have signed the petition? 32. Okay, we need eight more people to sign the petition, but I think we can do even better than that. Uh, I, I wanna get up to 45 by the end of this call. <laughs> the number keeps going up the longer you take. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the last thing that we want to talk about today, something that you can do, is you can get NAFTA postcards signed and delivered to your representative. This takes a little bit more work, but there's already 400 people doing it around the country. So if you're new to this, you won't be alone. And I know some of you have been doing this for a long time. So what you do is you ask friends and family to, sorry, ask your friends and family to sign postcards. Get the postcard signed also at local rallies, meetings, and events, and give a five to ten minute pitch uh, if, if you're at a meeting or at an event, and we can send you a guide. And then once you get a, a handful of postcards signed, you can deliver them to your member of Congress. But by that point, me or somebody else from our team will reach out and talk about what delivering the postcards actually looks like. So if you are able to do this, I want you to go to replacenafta.org slash request. And I know some of you need to hop off in two minutes. So please, let's make sure that you're able to do this in the next two minutes. Replacenafta.org slash request. And I am going to type this into, the, I'm going to type a lo uh, the link into the chat box. It's, it's a longer link that you're going to see here and it'll go directly to the page. Um, so I, I'm i asking 20 people on this call to sign up and do that and I will I will be watching. Uh, of our speakers, who is able to stay on the long the line longer? Ivan, ¿tú te puedes quedar otra media hora? Eh, no, tengo que salir, una disculpa, tengo que salir como en 15 ah. minutos. Bueno, pues vamos a pasar su contacto a los que están en la llamada. Sí, por favor, y una sí. disculpa. Iván has to hop off, but we are going to share his contact information with folks on the call. And then CDM, I think you also have to run to some other meetings today. But thank you so much for being on the call. Erika, are you able to stay on a little bit longer? Yeah, I can stay a little longer. Great. So Erika and I will stick around. We'll talk DACA, uh, migrant worker protections, and other labor protections, and how we're gonna how we're gonna protect immigrant and migrant communities, and also replace NAFTA with a better deal. You can type your questions into the chat box on your screen. We're just waiting for some questions to come through on the screen. Elizabeth, how many petition signatures did you end up getting? 38. Okay, we need two more people to, to fill out CDM's petition. Yeah. 
Okay, so we, we just got a question. Shouldn't we be doing more about the lack of transparency during negotiations? This seems like a major issue. Thank you, Selden. This is a question that comes up a lot. And yes, we want greater transparency. It's one of the things that I already mentioned. And it's something that Public Citizen has been working on. And uh, on the eve of the first round of NAFTA negotiations in DC, the US Trade Representative's Office told reporters that the text of NAFTA of NAFTA renegotiation would be considered classified and that it would not be made public as such. And they also sorry, and, and uh, the negotiators from the US, Canada, and Mexico were also required to sign non-disclosure agreements. And so that's why it comes down to putting pressure on our members of Congress, whether it's DACA or whether it's about ISDS being our bright red line on NAFTA replacement or whether, uh, and we also need to put pressure on U.S. Trade Rep Lighthizer about our expectations that there will be enforceable labor standards in a NAFTA replacement. And so we are very much focused on on what we're winning in the end and making it abundantly clear to our members of Congress that they must stand with their with their constituents and the people who help them get out the vote uh, and, and protect vulnerable communities. Okay. I think a few more questions just came in. Erika, there was a question about, are we calling the House or the Senate? Yeah, so um, that, uh, um, that link would actually make you uh, call um, the option. Um, at this moment, it would be great if you can call both, um, if you have the time. Um, I would say definitely the Senate would be uh, very important right now because, you know, Democrats have a lot more right now power in the Senate than in the House. But um, so priority would be the Senate. Uh, but if you do have the chance to call both your senator and your member of Congress, uh, that would be amazing. Thanks, Erika. And for not an after replacement, we are focusing on the House. But if you have time to work on your senators, please also deliver them postcards. Uh, and that leads us to the next question from Doug Sutherland. Do you have a target time for us to deliver the cards? I think right now Congress is overloaded with other issues, so I'm thinking October or November after the election might be a better time. Doug is in Connecticut, and Doug, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, in Connecticut. And I am glad to chat with folks in other states about the best time for your postcard delivery. But if you order postcards today, I think it's reasonable to take a month to get to them signed and to deliver them in October or November. So Rosia asked to hear, hear from Erica regarding Dreamers and whether they have some kind of binational dialogue with Mexico. That's, that's a great question and you know, I can only speak uh, sort of for myself and, you know, for what I know, um, there might be some folks who have been in these kinds of dialogues. Um, I haven't, and, you know, the, the, the folks that I have been coordinating with and, and working with uh, to protect DACA, um, we have been very, for the most part, focused on, you know, what we can do right now to push Congress um, and President, you know, and, and Trump basically to to make sure that you know DACA recipients are still protected, uh, but I think it's definitely something that we would really like to look into. For a lot of us, you know, we are not able to go to Mexico, um, so you know we we're trying. We have tried uh, for a couple of years now our best to uh, develop those relationships, um, even though we we're not able to to, to physically either. Um, you know, the, the dynamics there, but uh, really uh, great suggestion, and, and, and I think it's something that we definitely have to work on. Hmm. 
Hey, Dika, I want to make sure I get this question to you from Mary Levine because she's been excited to speak with you for a couple months now. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. She wants to know how can we form strong coalitions between immigrant rights groups, dreamers, and union leaders. This is the issue that can stop Trump. We need to unite somehow. Any ideas? I completely agree. Um, you know, I <laughs> I think this is the moment where everyone is really working hard to try to build those coalitions. Um, it's just, you know, it's it's been so many attacks uh, that are having coming our way from different uh, fronts of the, the Trump administration. Um, I, you know, will love to continue these conversations uh, with folks who are part of uh, different fronts. Um, and, you know, I think, like I said, a lot of dreamers uh, we have, and, you know, immigrant rights groups have been super focused on trying to protect people from all the attacks. Uh, but I think we will, I, I personally would love to, to have those conversations about, you know, uh, really using, um, or not using, but actually speaking the truth of this issue um, to, you know, to, to uh, contradict what Trump has been saying uh, and using immigrants as scapegoats. So I would be more than happy to, to talk to Mary and any other folks uh, who are interested on this. Uh, my, you know, my email, um, you can email, uh, I'm just gonna give my email and just, you know, try to, uh, for folks who are there, it's just erica at our revolution, um, uh, dot com. Um, you know, just specifically for folks who are interested on, on having these types of conversations, these types of uh, uh, work. Um, Thanks, Erika, and I'm typing your email into the chat box. It's Erika with a K, E-R-I-K-A, at ourrevolution.com. And I, I can also talk about how the trade movement has built relationships with uh, immigrant and migrant rights organizing. Uh, after we defeated the TPP, it was, it was this really celebratory period in that we defeated this horrible, horrible so-called trade deal and at the same time it was a really difficult period because it was right after the election and I encourage trade activists around the country to start showing up uh, for migrant and immigrant justice and for racial justice in their communities and just to go to rallies to go to uh, planning meetings and to get to know the people who are working on these other issues and so trade justice organizers around the country showed up and they built relationships and they helped how they could without asking for anything in return. And now that the NAFTA campaign is heating up, there's been a few places around the country where uh, trade justice organizers have worked with immigrant rights organizers to actually put on community dialogues on trade and migration, similar to what we're doing this afternoon. Thank you, Mary, for that question. Uh, there's another question that is, what is the provision in NAFTA that was mentioned that required Mexico to change its laws regarding the size of farms? I'm not sure, Selden. Let me look into that and get back to you. Send me an email to uh, respinola at replacenafta.org. I will type that into the chat box. Let's see what other questions came through on chat. Ah, looks like we got to all of the questions and there's a message from Ivan Polanco from ANEC, which is the National Association of Small and Medium Sized Agricultural Producers. He says, many thanks for this space and for, for listening to, to, to small uh, pr agricultural producers from, from Mexico. I can be reached and he, he provided his email. Uh, he said he has to get going to a meeting. So 
If there are, it sounds like there's no more questions for now. What we're going to do is we're going to send out a recording of this call and uh, and next steps, action steps, and we'll also send out contact information for all the speakers on the call. So grateful that we were able to create the space um, because trade and trade and uh, migration go hand in hand, uh, and that's what I've seen. There's a few more questions that came in. We will try to respond to them by email. Erika, any any final statements? No, just you know, thank you all for for staying on, and uh, you know, I think this is definitely a really great way to start this conversation. Um, I think a lot of people have been talking about this for many many years, but you know, this is a great way for us to make sure that it's amplified and that, you know, again, that we can push back against all the including attacks on immigrants um, because people don't understand that, you know, these trade agreements are also what is creating for people to, to leave their countries. Um, and so, you know, again, I'm affected by this and, you know, I'm a, I'm a DACA recipient and I am really thankful for everyone who will be making those calls, and, um, making sure that, you know, people like myself and my family are protected and continue to be protected. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon.